Do you know that one of the most common ways the devil destroys Christians today is through sexual immorality? God's blessing is on healthy sexual activity because it establishes unity in the home, strengthens the bond of love between the couple, and solidifies the foundation of the home where God can be worshipped. However, the enemy has taken this same blessing and turned it into a weapon to destroy the lives of God's chosen people. You see, whenever the child of God has sex or any sexual activity outside the marriage, it is called the sin of fornication, sexual immorality, or adultery. The devil uses these sins as gateways to come into your life and destroy you. We should not be ignorant of his devices, but instead know them and stand against them. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. You see, why is this matter very serious? God's word tells us that when we become children of God, we become one with Jesus in spirit, and not only so, we become a part of his body. Hence, whatever you do, it is implied that a part of Christ is doing it. Is that sending a message to you now? No wonder Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, said it was unspeakable to take his body, which was now a member or part of Christ's body, and join it in sex with a prostitute. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! If you will doubt anything in this life, dear saint, please never doubt the word of God as found in the Bible. Everyone may come with their own opinion of the written text and what they think is wrong with it and why their own perspective may be better, but do not fall for it. There is life-giving truth within the pages of the Bible and it's available to everyone who opens their hearts up to it. If you want to see faults, Satan will show you faults. But if you trust the spirit of the word to show you, you will find life in it. I'm saying this because of the current subject of discussion. Many people are going to come to you with one excuse or reason why there is nothing wrong, not just with sexual immorality as long as it is consensual, but with many other things, the Bible warns us against it. You must know that such person, no matter how great he or she is, is not speaking by the Spirit of God. The Bible clearly states in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. Before you say this was Paul and not God speaking, we see the same thing in the coming judgment as revealed clearly by God to John on the island of Patmos. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Our message is targeted as two categories of people, those who are sexually active and those who are about to give in to the temptation to engage sexually. If you are married or yet to be married, and you are engaging in sexual intercourse with one who is not your spouse, you are living in sin and on your way to hell if you do not repent and stop it. If you're thinking about it or secretly practicing it through graphic novels or pornography, you are already opening yourself up and setting yourself up for destruction by the enemy. The mystery of sex is that whomever you engage with sexually, you become one with them. This is beyond the physical joining that occurs, but also the spiritual. Biologically, we learn that there is an exchange of bodily fluids during sex. But what most of us do not know is that there is also exchange of spiritual content. 
People talk about sexually transmitted diseases alone and use that to warn against abstinence. And they are right, but that is only half the truth. You see, you can't blame them because many of them can't explain or understand the spiritual aspect of it. Therefore, the world, as they're prone to, try to go around such instructions to satisfy the flesh by producing and recommending contraceptives and other protections. This may work for some diseases or pregnancy, but there is no contraceptive on earth to protect you from the exchange of spirits during sex. This is why the best thing to do is steer clear off it. This message is specifically for believers because of their position in Christ. The unbeliever has it worse because they are spiritually dead already and sexual immorality is a way of life. They already need Christ whether they are sexually immoral or not. It makes no difference because without Christ in their lives, they are on their way to hell too. However, for the saint, this is different. Satan already rules in the life of the unbeliever, but Christ rules in the life of the saint. In order for Satan to have his way in your life, he introduces things to allow you to open yourself to him. When you fall into these temptations of the devil, he uses that as a means to attack your conscience, your destiny, and some of God's blessings in your life. There is a reason he is called the accuser of the brethren. He is the one that reminds you continually of the sin you have committed and why you are no longer wanted by God or good enough to be saved. His aim is to keep you under, in defeat, until you stop following Christ and He becomes your Lord instead. How many Christians have turned from God today? Not because of the sins they committed alone, but because of the attacks the enemy made on their consciences through the loopholes those sins created. You must be careful, dear saint. If you have been living in sexual sin before now, don't let another moment pass before you stop it. Consider this as God's sign to do so. Or maybe you have been involved and are trusting God to stop it because you don't know how. Make sure you pay attention till the end as well. This is also a message for you. We have prayerfully put this material together, trusting God to help everyone who listens experience God's saving power to break free from sexual immorality. Sexual sins are destructive weapons the enemy uses against Christians because he knows that when a believer gives his or her body over to a partner who they are not married to, they pollute their bodies. Why is this a serious sin? You see, apart from our bodies being a part of Christ's body, which is supposed to be holy and pure, when we become born again, our bodies become God's dwelling place through His Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19-20 Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You no longer own yourself, my friend. God bought you already. With what? With the blood of His Son, Jesus. When Jesus was dying on that cross, He was doing so, giving His life in exchange for you. Why? Because God loves you that much. The only thing He asks of you now is to live for Him. He died for you. And now he wants you to live for him. He wants you to allow his life find expression through you. Now, through the Holy Spirit, the entire Godhead lives inside you. A temple is called a sacred place simply because it is dedicated to a deity. This is the same for all religions. Whether it is built with wood, clay, or iron, it is an ordinary building until it is dedicated to a deity. The moment it is consecrated to any deity, that place becomes holy and is guided by different laws that honor that deity. Whatever you do contrary to those laws will be considered blasphemy against that deity and a desecration of its temple. This is the same with our bodies now. 
You see, in the Old Testament, God promised that one day he would no longer fill the temple built by the hands of anyone, but that he would begin to live in the hearts of humans. That prophecy has come to pass in our days. Now God lives in you and in anyone who has surrendered their hearts to Jesus Christ. And from that moment onwards, your body is his temple. You may not know this, but you are a walking temple. However, the question is, who occupies your temple now? Have you desecrated your temple so much that there are demons all around it? Or have you opened its doors so that demons have gained access and filled it with all sorts of darkness? Your body is God's temple, my friend. When you give it to sexual immorality, you are harming and polluting it, allowing demons in. And when demons have a foothold in your life, they will oppress you, destroying and corrupting whatever their hands can lay hold on. Do not give the enemy this room in your life. Don't keep letting him oppress you more than he is already doing. I'm not saying that it is easy to live pure and holy, not especially in the world that not only approves of it, but also promotes it massively. No matter the sector of industry, there is a degree of sexual engagement being promoted. We see them in movies, music, literature, fashion, media, internet, and everywhere else. Do you not know that no one is exempted now? Like while growing up, there were things we weren't allowed to watch and the censorship was decent until recent years. Now, even kids' shows have a certain degree or hints of sexual activities discreetly chipped in. Only sensitive people are able to notice it and caution their kids and loved ones from watching them. Think of how much sexual education teenagers are getting now. More of these are geared towards their engagement than ever their abstinence. They are presented with the false idea that sex is how you show love, receive love, or prove you are in the trend. So we have many young people who grew up wanting to feel loved and accepted, but only getting used and damaged. We are seeing a continuous increase in adults with emotional, psychological, and even health issues which grew up with them from their teenage, struggling to become better versions of themselves to no avail. These things have affected their views about life, about themselves, and in most cases, about God. The Bible is full of different characters who partook of sexual sins and faced the repercussions. Yes, there will always be repercussions. Many homes got broken. Some people are exposed to demonic oppression and some even possession. Some people engage and are emotionally broken in such a way that only God's grace can heal them and change their views on life. Some others get infected with one disease or the others, which in some cases might cost them their lives. The issues can include much more than this, physically and spiritually. Reuben brought a curse upon himself and his generations after him for a long time because he slept with one of his father's wives. Samson lost his anointing and cut short his life because of his involvement with an ungodly woman. Amnon's life was cut short for sleeping with his half-sister, Tamar. David slept with Bathsheba, killing her husband Uriah to cover it up. She got pregnant, but the baby died, and David was punished later as his own son, Absalom would stir up a coup against his own father, chasing him away from the country, and publicly sleep with all his father's concubines in public, all in one day. There is nothing good to gain from engaging in sexual immorality. Yes, you may get a few moments of pleasure, but what do you do about the things that were exchanged after all the pleasure evaporates? How do you deal with the guilt, knowing that you have sinned, how do you live with the fact that you have dishonored God's temple and cannot enter heaven this way? My friend, it's time to say no more to the devil. To take a stand and turn back to God so that the enemy does not deceive you until you find yourself where you never imagined you'd be. If you want to deal with this sin, 
which the enemy is using to destroy believers, here are a few helpful ways. 1. Acknowledge that you are in sin and then turn to God in repentance. You can lie to everyone else, but the greatest harm you can do to yourself is lie to yourself. You can never lie to God because He knows you more than you know yourself. So if you are serious about breaking out of the snare of sexual sin, you must first be honest about it to yourself. Admit that you are in sin and disobedience and then turn to God. It is not the time to run from God or from church. Run to God. He wants you because He is the only one who can fix you. The Bible says He is faithful and just to forgive all who come to Him confessing their sins and trusting Him to help them overcome it. As you come to God, ask Him to set you free from that spirit of sexual immorality and purge your life of every deposit from your past. 2. Start feeding yourself with the truth in God's Word. Our lives are defined by whatever we believe about ourselves. If you listen long enough that you are a sexual animal who can do nothing about your urges, you will soon believe that is who you are. However, the Bible already says that you are a new creature and you are no longer a slave of sin. Therefore, sin shall no longer rule over you as it did when you weren't saved. This kind of discovery empowers you to learn how to accept who you are and stand against anything that wants to change that. The more you feed on and speak God's word over yourself, you purge off the old and take on the new identity with new ability to resist the devil while standing in what God says. 3. Disengage and avoid triggers. Triggers are things that takes your mind back to your sin, not to make you guilty, but to tempt you again. This is where the real battle is. Therefore, in order to break free, avoid things, shows, friends, books, music, or anything that will trigger sexual urges while you are in your recovery process. The more you starve the lust, the thinner it gets until it dies. This is not and never will be an overnight thing, but through consistency in God's grace, you can get there. Joseph did not stay close to Potiphar's wife because he knew her plans, so he fled from her. You are not to condone sexual sin around you. In fact, it is the only sin you are asked to run from in the Bible. 4. Commit to a prayer life. There is a direct link between prayer and sanctification. The more prayerful you are, both privately and corporately with other believers, the more inclined and empowered you will be for holiness and freedom from sexual sins. These truths are helpful and will do you good if you commit to it. I encourage you to be sincere with God and intentional about being free. That is the only way it will turn out so for you. It is my prayer that God's power will break you free from Satan's bondage, giving you an escape from the trap of destruction. In Jesus' name, amen. Consider this both as an instruction and as a warning out of God's love for you. Today I will share with you why you need to learn not to collect every gift because just like God, Satan also gives gifts. When he does, trust me, it never ends well for the receiver. One of the greatest desires of every person is to receive value or valuable things into our lives. These values may come through things we gained as the result of our effort or work. For example, awards of recognition, harvest from a farmer's land, salary or profit at the end of a business cycle, and so on. They may also come through things we never anticipated or made for ourselves, just the doings of other people for us. For example, gifts, favors, promotions, and so on. I realize that although we love the first, we have desires for the second, especially deep inside our hearts. We may not say it aloud, but sometimes we may wish we could get some things without having to let go of the ones we already have. 
We wish that we would find some favors without even asking or paying anyone for it. I have heard people say things like, I wish I could just get a call to inform me that I've gotten a huge sum of money in inheritance or that someone just felt like giving something that would blow my mind and make my life better somehow. Gifts are great. And this is true. In fact, the Bible tells us that God always desires to give his children good gifts. James chapter 1 verses 16 through 17. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Please note that the gifts that God gifts are called good and perfect, meaning that whatever gifts he is not involved in would be opposite. That is bad and imperfect or unhealthy for you. The thing about the gifts of God is that it can be anything. God might give you directly, maybe spiritually, or give you physically through people. And because Satan always likes to copy everything God does, he uses the same methods. When Satan gives anyone a gift, he could implant them into your spirituality through one means or another, or send them into your life through people. However, the difference between the gifts of God and the gifts of the devil is clear. God's gifts come to make your life better, but Satan's are meant to destroy you little by little. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 22 says, The good that comes from the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. No wonder Jesus referred to the devil as the thief, who comes for no good reason but to steal, kill, and destroy. While Jesus comes to give life, Satan comes to rob you of life. Therefore, you the believer needs to learn something today. Is it okay to collect every gift from every person? Is it healthy for my life and destiny to always accept whatever I am given? Now, you must understand that as a Christian, you are different. Your way of thinking, choices, and desires are all subject to Christ. To you, Christ is more than a savior alone. He is also Lord and master. Therefore, you only live by whatever he approves and nothing less. This is why the child of God stays connected to God through the Holy Spirit, who guides your actions and choices. Their feelings or the feelings of the people they deal with do not lead the child of God. Instead, the Spirit of God leads them. Romans chapter 8 verse 14 rightly says, all those who are led by the Holy Spirit are sons of God. This is what the Christian faith refers to as discernment the ability to tell the intentions or spirit behind a thing, a thought, or an action. Do you know that without the help of the Holy Spirit, you may end up collecting a gift meant to destroy you, believing it is from God and not knowing it is Satan's work? That's true. This is what we mean when we say some gifts are not gifts, but curses. They are not curses only when someone speaks something evil over them concerning us, but also when they are not meant to be in our hands or when they are meant to entangle us. Do you know that somebody somewhere has been implicated and sent to pay for a crime he or she did not commit simply because they accepted a gift from the true perpetrators? Because of the gifts they received, they could not prove they weren't accomplices to the crime. A simple harmless looking gift could be all it takes to ruin a good person's reputation when it comes from a heart who has nothing but evil planned for it. Yes, God can deliver, but he wants you also to learn to know when to say no without looking back. Yes, there are needs in your life and some of those gifts honestly can look like they are the answers you need to end the shame and reproach you are dealing with. Yet you need to trust God to help you see beyond the moment and discover the cost of that gift in the long term. Do you know that the kind of blessings God has promised you are such that no one would take the glory but himself? God wants to be the one to whom all the praises must go, no one else. And in order for that to happen, you need to learn to know the people he is using and the counterfeit or destroyers Satan might bring. We can learn something from three characters in the Bible regarding this matter of knowing what gifts to receive and which not to. One, Abraham. The second is Gehazi. And the third is Christ Jesus, our perfect example. Please do note that I already mentioned earlier that what makes a gift a curse is not the enchantment behind it against you alone, but also the intention and the long-term damage it might bring to you in your possession, among other things. You see, a person could poison a meal and bring it to you as a gift of some sort, 
and in the goodness of your heart, you receive it with thanks, just as the scripture said. Then you could take that gift without receiving any mixed signal from God, even though it is a dangerous gift to you. But do you know that because of the covenant of God to you, his child, and the purity of your heart, that poison may not work in your life? He already said that this would be one of the signs which accompanies those who truly believe and follow him. In Mark chapter 16, verse 18, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. And this is true because it confirms what God says in Isaiah chapter 54, verses 16 through 17. See, it is I who created the blacksmith who fans the coals into flame and forges a weapon fit for its work. And it is I who have created the destroyer to wreak havoc. No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Abraham once went to war to rescue his nephew, Lot, from the hands of four kings who united against Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot lived at the time to invade and subdue it. God gave Abraham the victory, and he was able to defeat those kings. He came back with much spoils and victory for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Note that Abraham wasn't doing this because anyone asked him to, but because of his love for his nephew, Lot. When they got back, the king of Sodom gratefully asked Abraham to take as many spoils as he wanted, an offer that Abraham outright refused for one reason. Hear what he said in Genesis chapter 14, verses 22 through 24. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me. To Aner, Eshkel, and Mamre, let them have their share. Abraham knew God, and by the help of God, he had also learned how people who did not know God would act. God had promised him wealth and greatness, and this seemed like it was an easy way to get there. However, Abraham refused it because if he would be wealthy, it would be from the work of God in his life and not the spoils of war from a nation that did not fear God. Instead, he politely recommended his friends. One reason many Christians become enslaved by false gifts is greed. When you do not conquer greed, it will enslave you to people and things you have no business with. Do you know that you can lose your honor because you did not subdue your hunger for possessions and other material things of this life? Many people are no longer taken seriously because they allowed greed for gifts blind them when they were supposed to know better. Gehazi is another good example we can learn from. What made the gift of Naaman to Elisha a curse for him was simple. It was not his time to start receiving gifts from anyone, and so it did not belong to him. Maybe this was a setup to prove his focus on what matters most. If Elisha was truly his master, then he should reject whatever his master rejected. And alas, Gehazi did not have control over his greed, and he went after Naaman's chariot, lied against his master, and collected his gifts. He did not know that he was returning home with a curse, the leprosy that had left Naaman, not just upon him, but upon his generation after him. Gifts, my friend especially those from unbelievers who openly renounce God or have no respect for your faith, should be appreciated, but you must be wary of them and know when to say no. This will save you from many things. The Bible tells us that Satan promised to give Jesus the kingdoms and riches of this world if only he would bow down to him, submitting his lordship over to him. Of course, Jesus knew better and he rebuked the devil he knew that behind everything Satan gives, there is something tied to it. Also, Jesus knew that this gift was not what God had planned for him. Just like Abraham did, his greatest blessing would be the honor from dying on that cross and being lifted to glory, something that would never happen if he accepted Satan's offer. Also, when he was sending out his disciples to go preach, Jesus told them about receiving gifts from people. He said, a laborer is worthy of his wages, However, before saying this, he told them to make sure that had checked for something in whatever house they were to receive something from. He called the son of peace. 
If they, son of peace, was there, they were to remain and accept whatever was given. But if it wasn't there, they were to leave at once, no matter how much they needed the gift or how beautiful it looked. Luke chapter 10, verses 5 through 7 says, But whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. A different translation says, if someone who promotes peace is there. You are not to open your life to receive things from quarters where there is no peace toward you. This is why you must not let your eyes or ears deceive you. Always stay in alignment with the Spirit of God within you. Jesus has promised that he will guide you by the Holy Spirit into all truth, including the motives of people concerning you. He is a revealer of secrets. Trust and submit to him to reveal the things you need to know to you. When you do, you will receive blessings and not curses into your life. Love all people, but be sensitive enough to politely refuse certain gifts when the Spirit of God tells you to and when those gifts are tied to costly repercussions on your destiny. Is it possible to talk about salvation without transformation? I don't think so. Transformation is the very essence and definition of salvation. How else do you prove your experience or encounter with Jesus if there's no evidence in your life? Indeed, true Christianity is proven through the accompanying fruits. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.20-24, to that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. True Christianity and the acceptance of the saving grace of God through Jesus Christ sounds like a putting off of the old and a putting on of the new. That is the replacement of one thing with another. Let me lay a foundation here. The purpose of this message is to take you by the hand and lead you from where you are to a much more intentional Christian life. One in which you live as a true ambassador of God's kingdom and a worthy vessel he can use in a world covered by deceit and darkness. We trust God to use this message to correct your heart, rebuild and revive your confidence, and strengthen your faith in the righteousness and true holiness of Jesus. The call to salvation is a general call. That is, God beckons on all people, regardless of background, color, race, history, status, and so on, to come to Him and put their faith on His Son, Jesus Christ. In Titus 2.11, the Bible says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. God has set aside one day when he'll judge the whole world and destroy it because of the sin and corruption in it. However, he's paved the way for all to come to him to be a part of his family, thereby escaping the coming damnation. That's what it means when Jesus told Nicodemus, Whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God doesn't expect the unbeliever to live holy because no matter how he or she tries, they can't live holy, even when they do good. The good acts of a sinner may be commendable, but they can't be called holy before God because it's corrupted by the sinful nature they carry. So God's expectation of the sinner is not holiness, but repentance and acceptance of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. When the sinner becomes a saint, God's expectation then changes because now you have within you the ability to become like Him, holy. Therefore, God can say, Be holy because I am holy. 2 Corinthians 7.1 puts it this way, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. It is true that no one's perfect. However, each one of us can walk towards perfection. 
and this is the standard of God. When you become a child of God, you are not brought into God's family to do your thing your own way. No, you are brought into God's family and enabled to live by God's standard. God does not exist for us, but we for Him. It's very important that you understand this if you really want to have a successful Christian life. That's right, there is such a thing as an unsuccessful Christian life. A life that even though it began the journey, did not finish it well. Not everyone who begins this journey of faith eventually crosses the finish line in the end. Some will fall by the wayside, others will turn around, and some will turn to other distractions. I pray that you and I will finish well. Does God love us? You know He does. And every action of His is proof of that. It's His love that made Him provide His only Son to save a race on its way to destruction. It is love that makes Him take us serious when we don't take Him serious. His love makes Him discipline us when we need to be corrected as we make our journey. The love of God, His mercy and judgment all work together. He is not divided. For instance, you're listening to this message today because God loves you and wants to teach you something you might be missing in your life. You see, we live in a world of lies and deception, and so many children of God are blown here and there, led in the opposite direction of where God's pointing for us to go. They think that they know what they're doing, but in reality, they're destroying their Christian work. The passage we saw earlier makes it clear that we have the responsibility to purify ourselves. You can't just let your life go with the wind or the flow of this world. You'll just end up where you don't want to be. Being a Christian, like I mentioned from the beginning of this message, is characterized by a substitution of one life for another. It involves a surrender of yourself over to God's sovereignty, choosing to live by His standards rather than yours or the world's. Again, I repeat, being a Christian means to surrender to God's standard. When you choose a lifestyle or any action that goes contrary to everything God stands for, not only are you committing a sin, you're also destroying your Christian life bit by bit. What are some of these destructive habits that can ruin your Christian journey? 1. Attempting to mix the old life with the new. You cannot produce God's fruit or His results by sowing the seeds of the flesh or the world. Galatians 6, 7 to 8. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. In one of our previous videos, I shared with you that it was your spirit that got saved at the new birth, and that your mind wasn't. That's why you discovered that your mind still thinks and wants to make you do things like you used to. It's a programming, and therefore must be renewed and upgraded to God's system now. In the same manner, in receiving Jesus, you must understand that light and darkness cannot mix. The world lies in darkness and operates under the power and influence of the devil, the Lord of darkness. Yes, you were once there. Yes, you used to be like that. Yes, you are still in the world now. Still, you must understand that you're a new creation now. You've been washed now. Now you're okay by a different set of rules. Now you operate differently. Now you have a higher calling. Before you lived for yourself. Now, however, you live for God. When you think or act contrary to his mindset, like the illustration of the old and new wine, you'll only destroy yourself. Luke 5, 37 to 38. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. To come to Jesus and claim to receive him only to go back and try to live a life still hanging on to the way you used to makes your faith and salvation very questionable. Paul wrote, let the thief who is in Christ steal no more. This means that you have a responsibility to learn the culture of the kingdom of God, which of course rests greatly on love and holiness, and live by it. 
You make a mockery of the death and sacrifice of Jesus and the grace of God to think you can live a mixed life. It won't work. Satan will only take advantage of you and enslave you even more, trapping you until he succeeds in destroying your soul. Part of the change that may occur when you receive Jesus will require you to leave many things, and in some cases, many people behind, in order to be who God calls you to be. This is because the things you used to do will get in the way of your walk with God. Ungodliness brings reproach to God's name, exalts the power of Satan over you, and traps you in guilt in the very bondage Jesus died to free you from. Some of these mixtures also include secret sins, those sinful indulgences we participate in when no one's there. Coming from one who's had his own fair share of struggling with secret sins, I'll tell you this, it kills your spiritual life gradually. Unless you're not being honest with yourself, you will never feel confident before God or anyone at that. You'll not grow in faith to take authority over the devil because you know in secret you're still his slave. You will struggle in prayer and studying the word. Soon, you'll find yourself back where you came from in your Christian journey aborted. But we've not been called to this experience, dear child of God. Instead, we've been called to God's mercy, grace, love, and promises. I encourage you to choose today to yield to God by asking the Holy Spirit to help you separate yourself from the old way of life and embrace the new on Jesus so that you can bring glory to God. Two, passiveness toward the things of God. Another habit you must be wary of, which is a danger to your Christian life, is the lifestyle of being passive or indifferent towards the things of God. Permit me to tell you that it's a sign of spiritual deficiency to be indifferent toward things God's passionate about. Romans 12, 11, never be lacking in zeal but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. A sign of spiritual healthiness is spiritual fervency. A lack of it is a sign that something's wrong, and like an illness, if not properly handled, will cause great damage. Evidence of passiveness is when you aren't passionate about spiritual matters, like praying consistently, skipping prayer times or fellowship with other believers, neglecting your personal devotion with God, evangelizing or sharing your faith, and being more interested to talk about things other than God. Consistently practicing these things will leave you powerless and soon faithless. You may still profess Christianity, but your life will be void of its power. You must ask God to continue to stir His fire in your heart and make you more conscious and desirous of Him than anything else. If our eternal destination is heaven, then it should make greater sense to have heavenly passions. It should make more sense to desire more and more ways to engage with heavenly things than earthly. Don't you agree? Three, the habit of making and associating with ungodly companions. You see, the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. Wood is useful in its own way, but cannot be considered a tool for sharpening any sharp-edged tool. God does not say you should not be friendly. You know, we can't minister to or save the world by not interacting with it. Jesus was and still is the sinner's friend. He's accessible and willing to deliver them without casting off those who come to him. However, he is the sinner's friend. Jesus only calls the obedient saint his friend. John 15, 14. You are my friends if you do what I command. The Bible tells us that a person who walks with wise people will himself be wiser, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. Constantly befriending and associating yourself with the world is unhealthy to your walk with God because of the effect it can have on you. You must choose instead to surround yourself with like-minded people, fellow believers heading the same way you are, and having enough spiritual value to help you be a better Christian there are many other habits that can threaten your walk with God. However, God has given us a key to overcoming these habits, and it's to lay aside every weight in your life and fix your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1-2 Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders 
and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endures the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let Jesus be your focus, your purpose, your intention, and your goal. When he's all that matters, everything else will fall behind the shadow. Satan's deception will be exposed and you will break free. Ask the Lord to help you lay these habits aside and fix your eyes on Jesus until the end. The Bible is a great book to encounter the grace of God and connect with His blessings. It is the only book about which every other book about God and His ways has been written. It is a compendium of God's walk and works with man all through history. It is loaded with the formulas for the blessing, and it is also packed with different warnings about different things. The Bible speaks of sin in general and the consequences of it in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's standards for sin, in general, have never changed. Numerous times in the Bible, God warns us about sin, and there are numerous stories of people who have committed these sins and died as a result. The Bible gave warnings about different types of evil that men do and the consequences attached to them. The Bible speaks about the sins of idolatry, stealing, blasphemy, covetousness, greed, murder, and many others. But there is one particular one I want to talk about. In the Bible, the sins of adultery and fornication were explicitly dealt with by Jesus and the prophets on so many occasions. But in the book of Exodus 20.14 says, You shall not commit adultery. In the New Testament, the Bible went even further to put this same passage in a clearer and simpler context. In the book of Matthew 5.27, the Bible says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, Whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And our world at large seems to be accepting of this abnormality in the world. People do not frown upon adultery as much as they used to. As it is, institutions and businesses have been opened and licensed for the sole purpose of adultery. Children, men, women, married and unmarried, are all indulging in immorality, and nothing seems to be wrong with it anymore. There is a breakdown of values and spiritual principles in our world today. Everywhere you turn nowadays, there seems to be a cheaper way to commit adultery. On our phones, computers, tablets, and televisions are images that bring to mind thoughts of fornication and adultery. Pornography has taken over our society, and the devil has used this to ruin our homes and marriages. Marriages are no longer sacred covenants anymore, but rather a show of societal growth and achievement. Families have been broken up, and the plans of God cut short in their lives because of the rampant cases of adultery in our society. It is little wonder we are not seeing the hand of God in revival as we should in this generation. The rate of divorce keeps going up every day, and over 70% of these divorces are due to partner infidelity. The sin of adultery is one of the hindrances to God reaching out to our generation. Remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible? It was a city in a generation where men slept with men and women slept with women. Sodom and Gomorrah were cities of sexual immorality, fornication, and adultery. Does that sound familiar with what is going on in our world and society today? The city was met with total destruction and damnation. The Bible describes it in the book of Genesis at 19.24. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire down from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah. And he destroyed those cities, as well as the plains, the people who lived in them, and everything that grew on the ground. Such is the hatred of God for sexual immorality, and the same fate has. In verse 28 of Matthew 5, where I read earlier, the Bible made sure to mention the issue of adultery clearer. 
Many people have over time tried to explain adultery in different ways. Unfortunately, many of these originate from the church. Many preachers and pastors today have come up with explanations of adultery many times to fit into their lifestyle. Many people will try to define adultery as when a married partner has sexual relations with someone other than their spouse. But the Bible tells us that this goes much further. You can commit adultery in your heart by just looking at a woman lustfully. Your eyes are the gateway to your mind. Whatever your eyes see is what your mind interprets. And the Bible was very specific about guarding your heart because it is the source of all matters, including life and death. So, depending on what is going on inside your mind, you can either die or live in your heart. You have to keep your eyes trained on God and His ways. Heed the word of God in your heart so that you may not sin against Him. Constantly ensuring you monitor what your eyes transmit to your mind is key to avoiding the sins of adultery. There are a group of people, even in the church today, who do not accept the truths of the kingdom. The Bible warned us against false prophets and preachers in end times, and unfortunately, many of these false prophets are in the church today. So many of them have explained away the sacredness of marriage and trivialized adultery in the name of divorce. It is a common practice for a man to leave his wife and marry another woman. Some people today marry five times in their lifetime. Even preachers and pastors have explained it away, saying that this is freedom of choice rather than a covenant between two people and God. In the book of Matthew 19.8, Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Every day now, people divorce because of lust for another person while they are married to their partners. Pastors have left their wives and married members of their churches, and these sights and abnormalities have become a tradition in the world today. Because of their selfish aims, church leaders have not only changed this sacred ordinance of marriage, but endorsed it by joining these couples on the altar of God. The world is moving in a dangerous direction. What we used to know as the standard for living almost does not exist anymore. In a world where doing the right thing looks foolish and laughable, even in the church of God, when you try to do the right things, sometimes the leaders and pastors in the church try to discourage your heart and change your perception of these sins. Avenues for indulging this system of adultery and fornication abound everywhere around us. We see them more than we see the things of God projected on screens and tabloids. The cheapness of adultery in our generation makes it accessible to almost everyone and very rampant. As a child of God, the world will not change on our behalf. In fact, the Bible tells us to expect worse things to happen. The Bible tells us to expect these kinds of happenings in the last days. So instead of praying against this, prepare your heart for temptations ahead because they will come. The Bible tells us of a time when women will gather themselves and tell one man they want to marry him and they will be comfortable as co-wives. These times are here. The world will not go away with its sin. But the Bible also tells us that God has given us the choice whether to live or die. The choices of death and life have been laid before us. Choose to go with the world into adultery and kill your heart or choose the way of sexual purity and gain life through Jesus Christ. Your parents might be indulging it. Friends and loved ones might have made it commonplace for adultery. It might not even seem that serious after all. Your pastors, preacher, and church leaders may have tried to make it a normal place for adultery in the church and our society. But hear me, the standard of God has never changed in any generation. There's a consequence for every action in the kingdom of God and on this earth. The world's pressures to join in this sinful trend are immense. This shouldn't surprise the church of God because Jesus told us that temptations will arise and men will mock us for not believing and following their ways. The world might call us foolish and uptight. They might spite us and call us names in order to intimidate us into joining with them. 
but focus your heart on God and on the standard of His Word. The soul that sinneth shall die. This is the principle of God, and when the pressures of the world are on, find your strength in God because, as He said, He has sent His Holy Spirit to strengthen our hearts and resolve. Learn to confront your temptations with the Word of God. It is the only map to avoid death. Death in the Spirit can be expressed in many ways and comes in different areas of life. Every aspect of our dealings with God is a covenant in principle. You must keep an ordinance to receive life, and you must activate a covenant principle to receive blessings. When you break any of these, there is a death in that area, and this translates to other parts of your life. So, like Joshua and his people, today the choice is laid before you. Choose purity in God and receive life or choose the ways of sexual immorality, fornication, and adultery, and receive death. I encourage you to choose life today, to choose God today, and to choose sexual purity today. For if the Lord sees iniquity in our hearts, His hands are restricted from approaching to help or bless us. He already gave us His standard for qualifying to be a host with His presence. It is a clean heart, and a conducive environment for him to operate. He is a God of light, and iniquity has no place in him. Remember Jesus, the Son of God, on the cross of Calvary. The Bible says, when he had taken upon him the iniquity of the world, the face of God was turned away from Jesus, and at that moment, his human nature took over him, and the Bible records him asking why God turned his face away from him, and he died. In the same way, when you carry iniquity in your heart, God is turned away from you, and you are exposed to every danger of death. But once again, I implore you, choose life today, choose God, and choose purity. Because whoever breaks the hedge will surely be bitten by the serpent, and that is God's standard. God is the hedge around you. If you break that hedge, there are serpents who will strike you. I want to share a very important message with you today, my friend. This message is about a special kind of relationship in your life. Relationships could be an amazing gift or a destructive weapon in your life. It is true what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Look at the wonderful benefits of having a healthy individual in your life. I honestly believe that things are easier when we have the right person or persons in our lives. If you have that one person in your life who sees you for who you truly are and still love, appreciate and support you still, you are truly blessed. And indeed, God wants you to have such people in your life. There are different kinds of relationships that define us. The old saying, show me your friend and I will tell you who you are, still holds true today. The thing is this, the kind of person or persons you have in your life will have an influence, directly or indirectly, on how far you go in destiny with God. They will either drive you in deeper or draw you away from God. How do I know this? I saw from the Bible that God was much concerned about the relationship His covenant people, the Israelites, might have with different nations around them, and so He gave them warnings about that association. Of course, they would disobey those warnings and face the consequences. Yet, that did not stop God from speaking to them about it. God went as far as even warning the Israelites not to intermarry with those nations because they were idol worshipers and would most likely encourage the people to turn to their idols as well. This brings me to the center of my message today. There is a special person God wants you to have in your life. 
This person will end up becoming your spouse and helping you build a godly home where godly children who would represent the kingdom of heaven on earth will be raised. God, being so concerned about you, is about to use this video to teach you the signs that someone may or may not be the right one for you in marriage and what you must do about it. It is not just about loving someone alone or wanting to be with him or her. There are other factors that you must see as well. If you build marital relationships on feelings or excitement alone, don't expect it to last or be God's conduit into the world. Solomon's story is a perfect example of what can happen to a person if you marry the wrong person. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built the high place for Chemish, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives, who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. Because to Solomon's wisdom and wealth, he became very popular among the nations and everyone wanted to be in his favor. Most kings and leaders gave their daughters to him as gifts to seal their national diplomatic treaties, combined with the ones he married by himself because of his lust for much women. Solomon soon had a large harem of 700 wives and 300 mistresses. Solomon's untamed desire for much women plunged him into spiritual decadence. These women were idol worshippers, and they all came into their marriages with their idols. Soon they were requesting for their husband's support in worship, and Solomon gave in. He had built God's temple. Now he was building temples for idols all over the land for his wives. And soon his own heart turned too. Let me quickly state this first. I know we live in a world where marriage is not a big deal, and almost everyone, including some Christians, scorn at its sanctity. Our society has taken away the original divine definition of the marital covenant and replaced it with its own convenient definition, and many of us have bought into it because it suits us. To many individuals today, the marriage is just a legally binding relationship between two people with a strong emotional connection or some form of contract in place meant to satisfy a particular goal, a goal which, once met, nullifies the marriage like it was nothing. The marriage has been reduced to something anyone can do when they feel like it, and when they no longer feel like it, they could go their separate ways. However, dear saint, marriage is much more than that. It is God's business, His very own institution, where He continues to raise and increase His army on earth. We were told in school that the family is the smallest unit of society. It is a fundamental part of the society and nation building. Whatever decadence reigns in the families in a nation will reign in that nation at large. Why? Because the nation is made up of the family. I pray that you will listen to God's ultimate instructions regarding your choice of a partner and obey whatever He asks you to do. It is a good thing to find someone you want to spend the rest of your life with. God created us for interaction. He also made us with emotions so that we can connect with each other in intimate ways. However, when it comes to the subject of something as serious as the right person for you, then you must learn to know when God is trying to tell you that this is not the one or this is the one. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. 
Remember what I said about making your journey easier and sweeter because of the right person in your life. Your first greatest companion is your spouse, and so you must be extra careful when it is time to make the decision. Here are four signs that someone is not the one for you to get married to. Number one, they are not born again. The child of God has no business getting involved with the child of the devil, no matter the attraction. You must never forget that you are light, a child of the light, and they are darkness under Satan's dominion until they become saved. You may be friends with them to give God an opportunity to save them, but to become intimate with them and walk towards a marital relationship is a risk you should not take. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Many Christians have been greatly wounded, while some have not survived the error in this kind of decision. This should be one of the first things to look out for in someone you intend to allow into your personal space. Are they saved? Do they believe in Jesus Christ? Have they surrendered their hearts to Jesus as children of God? What belief systems do you share in common? What is the likelihood that tomorrow they won't turn back on you tomorrow because they were truly never saved? By being saved, I don't mean they are able to quote the whole Bible from cover to cover. This may be great, but it isn't the main yardstick. Are they saved enough that they exalt Christ in their lives above themselves, their desires and above anyone else? If you can answer this question in the affirmative, then they have passed. But if not, they must reconsider their relationship. Don't forget Solomon and his wives. Number two, they are not interested in the things of God and do not encourage you to become who God wants you to be. This is another big sign to watch out for as a child of God who honestly loves and wants to follow God all the way. And by this, I mean a serious Christian. You must check their interest in the things that interest you, which is the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1-2 through two says, Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Does this person have their eyes on heaven? How do they respond when you talk about the Bible, going to church, sharing your faith, obeying specific commandments that go contrary to popular culture, and so on? Do they prefer doing other things and consider God as just a diversion to answer as a religious preference? Beloved, in this day and time, you don't just need someone with the profession of Christ, but one with the possession, not just one with the words, but one with the fruits. You need someone who will be strong for you in the day of adversity when your own strength cannot carry you. You need someone who would at least support the visions God lays in your heart. There is no point being with someone and then traveling life's path alone. You cannot afford to miss this, my friend. Ask the Lord to help you notice this in time so that you do not waste your time, your strength, nor your resources on the wrong person. Number three, they try to seduce you to sin with them. Another serious sign is the sign of seduction to sin. I know that we all can be tempted to sin, especially with someone who we truly care about. However, the fear of God must be the center of our romantic relationships to help us honor Him with our bodies. The Bible has told us that our bodies are God's temples and we must honor Him with them no matter what. Therefore, a sign that someone is not right for you is that he or she consistently tries to make you break this commitment to God. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Whoever tells you that unless you fornicate with them, they will leave you is not the right person for you. Let them go. You must not displease God to retain anyone in your life. If you do that, you kick God out of that relationship, putting yourself at risk. It pays to wait, being willing to pay that price. 
you will not regret keeping your body for the right person. Whoever does not respect that does not deserve to be in your life. Number four, they are abusive towards you, risking your mental, financial, physical, emotional, and spiritual health. There's no excuse for abuse. This is a sign of a lack of the fear of God and of danger ahead, and you must take it seriously. Don't play around it. The right person will cherish and protect you. The wrong person will use and abuse you. The right person will appreciate you, trying their best to assure you of security. The wrong person will only bully you, make you feel less of who you are, and hurt you again and again. Once you notice these things, fear, anxiety, insecurity, timidity, or any form of danger or bullying, please, for your own good, consider it a sign that this is not the one for you. Do not try to endure it and get married to them. It is too high a price to pay. How do you get these signs? Draw nearer to God. The closer you are to God and the more you practice listening and obeying His instructions, the easier it will be for Him to speak to you and for you to hear and obey. Your safety, fulfillment, and peace is in your obedience to God's instruction. I pray you will be numbered among those who got this thing right. In Jesus' name, amen.